This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in 1 Thessalonians. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity, the privilege to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back and look at what we've seen so far beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5. Now as to the times and the periods, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you know accurately that the day of the Lord will come just as a thief in the night. When they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes on them, just like labor pain on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then we should not be sleeping as the rest, but must stay alert and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of love, faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Because God has not destined us for wrath, but through obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Verse 11 closes out this section about this topic where Paul tells the Thessalonians to encourage each other. Verse 11, Therefore, Encourage one another and build up each other just as you are in fact doing. Well, it's always nice to know that <clears throat> those who you are teaching, that you preside over, are doing what they're supposed to do. And this is what's going on with the Thessalonians. He tells them to encourage one another. This word encourage we've seen a number of times. It means to comfort, console, admonish. At times it can mean exhort a little stronger. Both of these commands for encourage and build up are present active imperatives. It's something there to keep on doing. The word for build up. Okay. Domeo, meaning to build up. Believers are to build up each other with the words that Paul has been teaching. But there are many ways that we build up each other. But in particular, this subject needs to get completely understood by this audience. So Paul closes out this section with these two commands to encourage one another and build up each other. Now, this passage told us that there is no way any Christian should be caught by surprise by the day of the Lord. If we stay alert and clear-minded keep our armor on and ready to go, we have nothing to worry about. Whether we have passed on, naturally there wouldn't be anything to worry about, or if we're still on earth alive and kicking, we are in the clear 
as long as we maintain our faith in the Lord. Now there will be terrible times up ahead. That's clear from Scripture. There will be waves of judgment upon the earth and upon the earth dwellers, the unbelievers. Those who have rejected God, the order of His creation, and most of all, His Son who died for them. The last phrase says, just as you are in fact doing. The Thessalonian believers were already encouraging one another and building each other up. So should we. There is a clear challenge here to all believers to make sure that you are ready for the Lord's return. As times worsen, and as we see more of our dear Christian friends struggling in their own lives with jobs and finances and health, perhaps in a country like the United States that seems to have lost its way, lost its moral compass, we must keep all of this in perspective. As things wind down, as we near the end of those final days, we must be encouraged that we are a protected people. If the Lord sees fit for us to become martyrs or to be taken captive in the future, remember this is what happens to many of the best Christians who ever walked upon this planet. Paul considered whatever he went through on this earth, and he went through an awful lot, not comparable to the blessings in eternity, to the reward he will receive for standing for Christ. So perhaps we should use a modern phrase that I hear a lot today. It's an opportunity. An opportunity to glorify God in our own personal lives in a very dramatic fashion. And then we who are still here will meet the Lord in the air and move into his kingdom on earth together with the Lord forever. Now those of you who have taken these studies seriously are preparing yourselves in one of the best ways possible, not only for yourself, but for other Christians. And by that I mean you have opportunities to encourage and show people the truth of this matter. Be in prayer for all believers, for rulers around the world, praying for their salvation, for the freedom of their countrymen, to worship Jesus Christ. For missionaries roughing it out there in the field. For those pastors and teachers trying to teach the word to a predominantly negative audience. By that I mean they really don't want to hear the word. Stay pure. Stay holy. Flee from those sins that devastate the body and the mind. And I hesitate here to give direct application. But as you know, if you've watched much television or even, as I've noticed, the advertisements on even news programs get quite lewd. Now listen, there are a lot of Christians out there and, and maybe you're one of them, who are constantly on the lookout for signs, for miracles, for the fulfillment of prophecy. You may be into this teacher and then into that one, whichever one brings on some excitement or a thrill. And I'm not trying to be 
harsh here. But to say that we're not to be so occupied with these type of things that we lose track of what we're really supposed to be doing. That's one of the dangers of living in the days in which we live. We have a tendency to want to say, I wonder if that's the Antichrist, or I wonder if, if it's almost here any moment. I, I wonder if this is going to happen soon. What's he going to do? I wonder if this next storm is the beginning of everything. And, and we get distracted from the basics of going back to the Word of staying in the Word, of living in the Word, of living obedient lives. Remember the Jews, the Pharisees who vigorously studied the Word, the Mosaic Law, to, to try to live the law the way they thought they should. Of course, they added a lot to it. But these are the very people who missed the Messiah. They were looking for signs. They were looking for something different than what they got from the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah to come in a different way. And when he did, they missed it. They missed the biggest, most important sign of all, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, right there in front of them. Now, there are a lot of misguided teachers out there. And by that I mean they, they teach certain subjects that are just wrong. However, and this is not really in their defense because that's, this is not even an excuse. They're teaching what they were taught. Even what their Bible schools and colleges and professors believed and taught them. Add to that many of the most popular books and series. And they never, now listen, they never sat down and dug out the truth for themselves. Now many believe, well, these men have done it, and they've done this, and they're in agreement with this group and that group. Not all. In fact, there are entire denominations that go against much of the popular teaching today. And what happens is, rather than study for themselves, and I'm talking about individual believers also, where you do line upon line and precept upon precept, the easy route is to go with what sounds good. What's on the bookshelves in the Christian store? What makes the simplest sense, yet not seeing that there's a lot of information there that's left out? Now, folks, some of the things that we study, and you've seen me chart out things that can get a little bit complex, but you can follow it. You just have to build up to it, like anything that is deep, that develops some depth. We have to learn a little bit at a time, and we're given the road map. We just have to study it. You know, the Lord didn't make it easy. And one of the reasons is because it's a challenge to our faith. It's a challenge to our motivation. We're told to examine the scriptures, to see for ourselves. And if you don't know this by now, until you really get down and examine the scriptures and compare them, and the tools we have today, especially on computers, are marvelous. This is a test of our faithfulness. One of the reasons that Israel had false prophets, the scripture says, was to test the faithfulness of the people. Now, since I can remember, 
especially in the 70s, it was the rapture was just around the corner. Everything is set. Everything's on stage. The nations, uh, nations are in place. It's going to happen this generation. Uh, Israel's back in the land. And it goes on and on and on. Jesus is coming any time to take his bride in the air and the tribulation is going to start on earth and we're going to go to heaven and get our reward. Is that what the scriptures say? Well, by now, if you've went through Thessalonians seriously, you know there's some problems with those views. Of course, we're not done yet. We're just about halfway, maybe a little over halfway. Yet, as we go through these scriptures, we see a different picture than what is painted today in many Christian circles. And my challenge to you is to check the scriptures out for yourself. If you're sticking with these studies, that is part of learning. Now, let me get, give you two admonitions along with what I've just said. First, don't get caught, so caught up in the popular view that you forget to check all the scriptures for yourselves. I've seen the way this is done. They'll take you to one scripture, then they'll jump over to another scripture and say, see, here's how it is. But then they don't go to what Jesus said or what Peter said. So what they do, they take these different pieces and put them together differently. So what I'm saying is, get all the pieces first. Then put them together. Now we will continue to piece this together as we progress through these two epistles. But just the reading of these two epistles, by that I mean just an objective, just setting back and objectively read it for what it says. Read what Jesus said about it. Read the sections of scripture that Paul have said, has said about it. Combine them with what Jesus said. And these things will point us in the right direction. The second thing I would admonish you is, and this warning is from Paul, who's also doing the very same thing in this letter, that I would encourage you to always stay with the basics. That is, keep doing what's the most important thing to study the Word, to believe the Word, and apply the Word. Don't be distracted by those things that keep us away from the basics. We're not destined for wrath. That's very clear. We will be saved if we keep following Jesus. We'll be saved from the present wrath, the future wrath, and the final wrath. That's not what Paul's concern is for the believer. What is his concern for the believer about this subject? That he's ready. That he's ready. And if you're ready, well, as you used to say back in the day, no sweat. Now remember some of the things we've seen in this epistle. These are some of the basic things. To love one another. Keep things simple. Mind your own business. Work. Live the quiet life. 
but do your service to the Lord. Grow in the word. Develop your gifts. Use your gifts. Contribute to the body of Christ. And don't forget that the body is designed so that we depend upon each other. We need each other. Now, I know there's a lot of churches out there that are not worth attending, and people keep saying, well, you got to go to church, you got to go to church. Well, I think the scripture is also clear that if there is not a sound, sound Bible teaching church, you're doing yourself more damage than good. And it may be just you and your family or you and a handful of people. That's the way it was in the days of Paul also. So what do you do? You do what God has gifted you for wherever you are. You do the best you can in the power of the Spirit. Don't expect to fit in many of these churches that have gone the ways of the world. We shouldn't fit in those churches. Remember the Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love. These are to be developed in our Christian character. These virtues sum up who we are. We are a people of faith. We're called believers. We believe God and His Word. We are a people of hope. We know for certain that we are bound for glory with our Lord Jesus forever. This is what keeps us going. So matter, no matter if we suffer, that's part of the program and doesn't compare to the reward and blessing that await us in glory. The virtue of love. We love people. We do not purposely offend. We give the benefit of the doubt. We speak the truth. We give the gospel correctly. Even though it's not the popular gospel, which is no gospel at all. We love the brethren. We love our neighbors. But above all, we love God. As this letter comes to an end, we have learned instruction from the Apostle on the Christian way of life. We've learned of events related to the parousia, the coming of Christ. And now we come to the two final sections that are important to the very fabric of of the local assembly. The first section has to do with how we view and treat those who shepherd and teach us. Verse 12. Now we ask you, brethren, to respect those who labor among you and preside over you in the Lord and admonish you. First, Paul asks that the assembly properly recognize their leadership. These are those who pastor and teach them. He gives three functions of these leaders. And these three functions gives them good reasons to respect their leaders. Now don't miss this. Just because he's a leader, he's in that position, that doesn't demand his respect. Let's see what demands our respect. Let's first of all look at the word for respect. 
Actually, it's a fairly common word in our Bible. The present active infinitive of the verb oidai basically means to know. You say, well, how do we get the translation respect here? Well, sometimes the basic meaning of the word is either metaphorical or expects you to go a little further in its meaning as it develops in the context. The idea here is that you know these leaders. What they do, how they do it, and what it takes for them to do what they do. We are to show them respect. If I might use a simple illustration, there are those who admire, uh, for instance in sports, someone who can hit 350 batting average. Because if they ever, ever stood there and watched a fastball, a curveball come at them, they know how hard it is to hit it. But that's an athletic skill. But often it's the ones who can hit the ball that get the most honor and respect. When it comes to the leader in a Christian assembly, there are at least three things they should be doing. And if they do them well, we should respect them. Now, you might look at some of the different translations. You may not see that they have the word respect. I know the NIV 84 does. New International Version 84 has it right. <clears throat> There's one lesson I've learned from pastoring and teaching for these many years. And that is to know what it takes to produce the in-depth teaching that is required for spiritual growth. By that I mean the time and the effort to study the word in the original languages. Occasionally you'll have to do a, a, a textual criticism to put these things together so they make good sense because just as we saw with the word oida. How do we get the word respect out of that? And sometimes we have to do that for two or three words of passage, maybe more. And to discover what the apostle is really writing and what he means. In the meantime, a pastor who's in charge of a sizable assembly has to constantly do battle with other Christians in the church that really don't understand the importance of biblical truth in their lives and apply it. They like the surface level type of things, everybody being nice to each other. That's fine too. But that's not why we're there. Now let's look at the three things, the three things that Paul says these leaders are doing. First he says they labor. Now we ask you, brethren, to respect those who labor among you. Now there's nothing in particular pointed out here as to the labor they are doing, but it's not the physical labor, you know out there mowing the church's grass or painting the building or doing the roof. But anyone who lives in this day and times and wants to teach the truth knows what it is to try and put two or three lessons together a week. teaching the Word of God from the original languages, digging out the word meanings, making sure you're right. Sometimes there's textual criticism, as I mentioned, dealing with theological issues. 
There's a whole list of academic things that one has to do. And this is more than most pastors ever do. Many rely upon books that basically tell them what to say. And that's between them and the Lord. Don't misunderstand me. But I also know when I've been to these churches, attended these churches, and yes, they say some things that are true and that are applicable and are helpful. But in my view, I need a lot more than that. I think most believers do. So the pastor can work hard to get his spiritual meal ready for the congregation. And there's only, well, there's usually some who can take it all in, but many times some just get a few bites. It's often the case that those who studied in seminary and have developed the language skills lose them rather quickly because they don't use them. It's very demanding of one's time. It's hard to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning and study in a four or five hour block five or six days a week and then maybe pick it up again in the afternoon and often in the evening. Especially with so many other community duties, church duties, things that people expect the pastor to do, to be a community leader, to be involved in so many of the social issues, when in fact many of those are very worldly, and many who are involved in that are not, not only not Christians, but often they wouldn't have the foggiest what it means to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Now, one of the major things I've tried to teach in this ministry, and this is really what kind of separates this ministry from most others, is that I've tried to teach the critical importance of each believer to learn the word for himself and believe it and then make your own application. This is what makes you spiritually mature. You can think on your own two feet. You know what to do and you do the right thing. It doesn't mean there won't be tough decisions. It won't mean it doesn't mean there won't be some things you're going to be puzzled about and you might need some advice or wisdom from another Christian who's been there or is more wise. But basically you reach the point where you either know the answer or you know where to find it. And occasionally you have to just be patient and wait for the answer to come by just continuing to study. That's true of me still. I will hold off on teaching certain subjects because I just don't think I've got a grip on them yet. I will hold off even doing videos until I think I've got a much better handle on it. So the pastor who gets respect here is the one who labors. By that, he works hard at his studying, preparing his lessons, and teaching. I'm not talking about preaching. Preaching, that's a whole other ball game, pretty much. You're pretty much caught up in the methods and styles and illustrations and stories and, and communication skills and this and that. Uh, you know, I've, I've been trained to do that, too. And I can do that, and I can even do it well. But I've also learned that the time you spend on preparing those type of sermons could be spent on studying deeper. And I know that in the past I've reached some sort of a compromise on this. I've done the preaching, but I've also done the teaching. Now, you can do preaching and have a lot of good content. But often, that's not line by line and precept by precept. And I also know that sometimes all, all that some people can take is a sermon. 
If you start teaching, they'll leave. Because they're not there to really learn. They're here to hear a few encouraging words to pick them up for the week. Sometimes to do their nod to God, then go about their lives. But that's not, pa that's not what pastors and teachers do. We labor. 1 Timothy 5.17, Paul writes to young Timothy, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. The word for preaching here doesn't mean today's typical preaching. It's usually in the area of exhorting, admonishing, stronger words. Now some do that in preaching, I don't, I don't deny that. How many preachers preach through an entire book? Uh, we're coming up on, what, 13, 14 lessons just in 1 Thessalonians? A solid hour? How many preachers do that? I remember going to church as a kid, and this is a big, big Baptist church, and he pretty much knew what was going to happen at every moment. There'd be the announcements. There would be the singing and maybe a testimony, more singing, and then about 25 minutes before the hour, the sermon would start, would start and end right on time, about 20, 25 minutes later. And yes, you get some truth, and yes, you'll get some growth, but at this point in many of your lives, you need solid meat. Let me show you 1 Timothy 5.17 again. Look at the word. Work hard. That's the same word for labor in our passage. Now we ask you, brethren, to respect those who labor among you. Labor among you. Present active participle. Copy uh oh. Work to exhaustion. Labor with wearisome effort to toil. Those who work hard in ministry are those who study the text, drawing on what they know in the power of the Spirit to provide and present God's truth accurately. Now, I've had a number of jobs while in ministry, full-time, part-time jobs. And I can tell you that all those jobs, even those where I was a supervisor and had a lot of responsibility, they were easy compared to the mental and physical fatigue that goes into research and study. Of course, now as I've gotten older and my eyes can't take as much, it makes it even more of a challenge. But that's not a complaint. There are many a times I've, I've been ready to go off to a job just because I was worn out from studying. The next function that we see these leaders do that demands respect is that they preside over you. Prostami, to superintend, to preside over, to be over. This is the man or men who watch over your life among the church body. 
They make sure you get sound teaching. That you are protected from false teachers and their teaching. And there's a lot of it out there. That you do not get caught up with the popular movements that are sometimes cultish or even worse. There's having to deal with those within the church who really want to promote their own ideas and what they think this church should be doing or what the pastor should be doing or the elders. And they have nothing to do with ministry or what the church is supposed to be doing. And often the cover word for these activities is ministry. So many things are called ministry. Whether it's little evangelism or building up the body of Christ goes on. Entertainment to exercise. Sports teams to musical groups. The dance team. Are you kidding me? Oh, well, don't you remember Peter and Paul and the baseball team? Peter pitched, Paul caught. Really? You know, I, I just want to make the point that if the, if, the, if the church and the pastor and the elders are not teaching the word, what are they doing? Where do these churches get this stuff from? Well, I know it's a popular movement. They've learned that to get people into their church buildings so they can get the money, so they can build the buildings, so they can have new ministries, as they call them, they need bodies, so what they do, they start playing all these games. And frankly, if you're there to hear the word, it makes you sick at your stomach. I've gotten up and walked out. It was so ridiculous. More than once. Or I see it coming, I leave. And yes, the church had psalms and they had hymns for the congregation. But what goes on today, the performances... Uh, the plays, the, the, the musical groups, the stuff to attract the crowds, when in fact the main thrust or purpose of the church assembly was to hear the word. Look at the next to the last verse in this epistle. Here, let me bring it up for you. Verse 27, next to last verse. Paul writes, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. When's the last time you were in a church where they read the entire epistle to the congregation? Doesn't happen, does it? It doesn't happen. Wouldn't take that long. Not at all. Take a couple of breaks in between. It doesn't get done. Why? You see, truth must take a priority. The leader who presides over you helps you. He helps you in the word. He helps you in time of need. It may be encouraging words when you're doing well. But you see, that's also the responsibility of the assembly as we will see some commands later on in this end of the epistle. The leader should have set the example. But you know, he's not gifted in every area. That's why you have the body of Christ. And it's also true that it's rare for a leader to have the good reason to stick his nose into your business unless you're doing some sort of harm to the church or church members the third function that the spiritual leader should be doing he admonishes you nuthateo this word means direct instruction on how to correct a behavior or belief. Now don't miss this. Direct instruction on how to correct a behavior or belief. 
It may be strong and it may be stern. If someone is in bad behavior, someone needs to talk to him. Or tell him to stop it. Some would argue, well, just give them time. They'll come along. They'll come along. If they're an adult and they've been a Christian for a number of years and you know they know better, how much time are you going to give them? Especially if they're doing damage. Those who admonish, these are the leaders who say the tough things that need to be said. Their idea of counseling is to tell you how it is and what you must do. They don't beat around the bush. If you're going down a path, say what you need to say to get them off of it, even if it's strong warning. But you say it in love, mind you. But you're willing to tell them what they need to hear Maybe even when they know what to do, and yet they don't want to hear it. You know, I think that people who've had children know exactly what I mean. We as parents often love our children more than our parents, will, I mean our children will ever know until they have their own. And we're willing to face them and argue with them and stand up with them and stop them because we love them. No, I know we don't treat our fellow Christians like our children. But there are times we need to speak to them in strong words and terms to help them get back on the path. It might be, why do you keep going to that church? What did you learn today? That was always the test of my children. If they decided to visit a church, I say, what did you learn? Now, the men who do these three functions, who labor, who preside, who admonish. These demand our respect. Paul adds one more point to these thoughts. Verse 13. And to esteem them most highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. The men who do these things are worthy of the most high respect to be esteemed. You know, Paul knew the value of Christians um, and the importance of their leaders. He knew the value that a good leader has for a congregation. And by that I mean he knows that good leaders are those who protect the flock from wolves, from predators. The whole barrage of evil that gets thrown at the assembly of Christians. These men may be missionary pastors, pastor teachers, or some who are called elders in the church, but these men who do these functions well, who work hard at it, demand our respect. The word here for esteem, hegomai, present middle infinitive, means to esteem, respect, appreciate. They're highly Appreciated. That's an adverb, most highly. It's a big, long one. Who 
huper ek parisu, super abundantly. That's a good match. Big long English word. Exceedingly. And to esteem them super abundantly. That means a lot. And it's to be done in love. You esteem them super abundantly in love. You show your love by words of appreciation, being respectful, keeping them in prayer, helping them care for their needs as they help care for your spiritual needs. Now, why are we told to esteem them most highly in love? Look at this important point. Because of their work. Ergon. Ergon. E R G O N. This term is basically used the way we use it today. It's what we do. Often, how we are identified. You know, he's a plumber. He's a businessman. She's a housewife, a merchant, a mother. That's how she spends her time and energy. It is the spiritual leader's work that brings respect and esteem from those to whom he ministers. If a pastor teacher is not tending the flock, not feeding the sheep, not loving the brethren, his work is going to be low quality and quantity. And like any work that is shoddy or low quality, it usually does not get much respect. So it is true of the pastor, the pastor teacher, the leader over you. Now I honestly don't understand why some pastor teachers are held so high when their work is so shoddy. Now, obviously that's between them and the Lord. But if I can't feed off of them, I'm not going to be there. I'm going to go for the Word. Even if you have to sit down and just read your Bible. I've sat in congregations where I just decided, well, I'm not getting anything from this guy. I'm just going to read my Bible for a while. And that's what I do. And let me make this clear. I, 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 I don't want you to be misdirected here. This is important. We respect and esteem our spiritual leaders not because of their position or even their person. Oh, he has such a fine family. He's so respected in the community. You know, he's a leader here. He's a leader that. He's been in the military. He's got all these medals and this and that. Or he's done this in business. He's made millions of dollars. He decided to get out and go into ministry. That's not where we get the the man to respect people or to respect leaders. We do appreciate their gifts, but it's their hard labor and their final product that we appreciate. Now, I know it's difficult to separate the two, but think of how much easier it is to appreciate any, any teacher who has done deep research to bring you the most accurate history. Or a carpenter who spends hours and hours on building a piece of furniture for your house. And you know the work and the time and the skill and how meticulous he has to be, how careful that he doesn't ruin it in one stroke of a tool. If it was not for the work produced, we really wouldn't appreciate him, would we? Don't miss this point. If the product is not there, if the quality and the quantity of teaching is not there, and you respect him for all the other things he does besides that, 
you're likely misguided. Well, I hope you get the point here. Well, in the next part of this passage, Paul changes direction in his subject matter. And that's where we'll begin next time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us your truth. And we ask, though, this lesson is one that might be basically different than we usually have. We ask that we will begin to be discerning with what we do. And by that, with the churches we attend, with how we spend our time and energy, our resources, that we might point all of that in the right direction so we might grow spiritually to encourage other believers to perhaps find a group of believers who really love the Lord. If that's not the case, then connect to believers somehow. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.